2 Kings chapter 4, beginning with verse 18, the word of the Lord is as follows. One day when her child was older, this is the woman of Shunem, he went out to help his father who was working with the harvesters. Suddenly he cried out, my head hurts, my head hurts. His father said to one of the servants, carry him home to his mother. So the servant took him home and his mother held him on her lap. But around noontime, he died. She carried him up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, then shut the door and left him there. She sent a message to her husband, send one of the servants on a donkey so that I can hurry to the man of God and come right back. Why go today, he asked. It's neither a new moon festival nor a Sabbath. But she said, it'll be all right. So she saddled the donkey and said to the servant, hurry, don't slow down unless I tell you to. As she approached the man of God at Mount Carmel, Elisha saw her in the distance. He said to Gehazi, look, the woman from Shunem is coming. Run out to meet her and ask her, is everything all right with you, your husband, and your child? Yes, the woman told Gehazi, everything is fine. But when she came to the man of God at the mountain, she fell to the ground before him and caught hold of his feet. Gehazi began to push her away, but the man of God said, leave her alone. She is deeply troubled. The Lord has not told me what it is. Then she said, did I ask you for a son, my Lord? And didn't I say, don't deceive me and get my hopes up? Then Elisha said to Gehazi, Get ready to travel. Take my staff and go. Don't talk to anyone along the way. Go, go quickly and lay the staff on the child's face. But the boy's mother said, as surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I won't go home unless you go with me. So Elisha returned with her. Gehazi hurried on ahead and laid the staff on the child's face, but Nothing happened. There was no sign of life. Returned to meet Elisha and told him, the child is still dead. When Elisha arrived, the child was indeed dead, lying there on the prophet's bed. He went in alone and shut the door behind him and prayed to the Lord. Then he lay down on the child's body, placing his mouth on the child's mouth, his eyes on the child's eyes, and his hands on the child's hands. And as he stretched out on him, the child's body began to grow warm again. Elisha got up, walked back and forth across the room once, and then he stretched himself out again on the child. This time, the boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Then Elisha summoned Gehazi, called the child's mother, he said. When she came in, Elisha said, here, take your son. She fell at his feet and bowed before him, overwhelmed with gratitude. Then she took her son in her arms and carried him downstairs. Thus far, the word of the Lord. The woman said, did I ask you for a son, my Lord? Didn't I say, don't deceive me and get my hopes up? And Elisha said to Gehazi, Get ready to travel. Take my staff and go. Don't talk to anyone along the way. Go quickly and lay the staff on the child's face. But the boy's mother said, Surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I won't go home unless you go with me. So Elisha returned with her. I want to deal today from the subject, the call to prophetic agency, and if I had to give it a subtitle, I would, I would just say, you must handle this. The call to prophetic agency, subtitle, you must handle this. This past week, I had an opportunity to speak to a group of leaders under 40 years of age through a program sponsored by the Community Building Initiative. It was conducted as a round robin type of thing, sort of speed dating type of format with five or six, and there were about 
eight or nine teams, and, and we were talking about the issue of leading in this critical time. As I've been sharing with you these past weeks, so did I share with them the notion that I believe this is a time calling for ownership and agency, that those who would seek to make a difference must heed the call to own where we've been, own where we are, and own where we hope to go. They must be willing to exercise the agency that they possess in positive and redemptive ways. Ownership and agency go hand in hand. Ownership, the recognition that there is a responsibility and accountability that I have simply because I exist. My very existence confers a responsibility and accountability that I can't shift to someone else. I must own myself. Social psychologist Albert Bandura describes agency as being the human capability to influence one's functioning and the course of events by one's actions. There are four functions through which human agency is exercised. One such function is intentionality. That is to say, people form intentions that include plans and strategies for realizing them. The second function involves temporal extension by agency through forethought. That is, we set goals for ourselves and we foresee likely outcomes of uh, prospective actions to guide and motivate our efforts uh, anticipatorily. But, but, the, but, but there's also the, the, the third, the third agentic function is self-reactiveness. That is to say, we are able to react to what comes our way. We are able to regulate and modulate our activity. And then the fourth function is self-reflectiveness. That is to say, we are able to reflect back upon what we've done. We are able to become aware of ourselves and make corrective adjustments if necessary. Each one of us possesses agency. And there are five categories of, of agency that I, would, that I would lift up before you. The first is uh, they are personal agency, they are practical agency, positional agency, political agency, and economic agency. Those are the five categories of agency that, that each and every person has. Personal agency arises out of who we are as individuals, the talents, the gifts, the anointing, the experience, the exposure, the interests that we have. The, this agency is just about you being who you are. You have agency simply in your being. But then the second is practical agency. This is how you bring who you are to bear and to influence what you can control. This is whom you choose to be in any given moment, what you choose to do, where you choose to go, how you choose to act, where, when, and how you choose to insert and assert yourself in a given circumstance. The third type of agency is positional agency. There is capacity that you possess through the various roles and positions that you inhabit. There is the agency that I possess as a man, as a son, as a husband, as a father, as a brother, as a preacher, as a pastor, as a board member, as a citizen. There, there is positional agency that, that I have, that you have, but not only do you have personal, practical, and positional agency, but also you have political agency. You count. You matter. As a person, you count. Through the census, you help decide how many representatives we have, how 
many districts are drawn, how funds are dispersed to the state, where funds go to needy programs. You count. You matter. Your, your voice matters when you show up at city council, county commission, school board, and public hearings. You, you count when you register and vote on ballot initiatives and vote in, uh, in elections. You count. You have political agency. But then lastly, you, you possess economic agency. I was trying to, I was trying to find, a, find a P for that last one. The only thing that I could come up with was paycheck. You have economic agency. How you spend and where you spend and when you spend, with whom you bank, with whom you invest, counts and matters. You have agency. And at its very core, agency is given to us by God. The capacity to choose, to determine, to reflect, to adjust, to create, to transform are a part of what it means for us to be created in the image of God. It is conferred unto us as those who are created after God's image and in his very likeness. It is what separates us from the rest of the created order. It has as its purpose the performance of the good that God foreordained. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, Verse 10, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do good things he planned for us long ago. This agency that we possess is for the good that God has planned for us to perform in order for us to demonstrate the masterpiece that he has created in Christ Jesus. I firmly believe that we are in a season where God is calling for us to exercise and recognize the agency that we have and for the good that God has in mind. And therefore, we cannot sit back and look for others to exercise their agency. We can't delegate the agentic to other people. Each one of us must hear God's call of prophetic agency saying to each one of us, you, you must handle this. This, this, this one ain't for anyone else. Like, like Budweiser said, this Bud's for you. This, this time, this season, these circumstances are for you to exercise your agency. You must rise up to it. You must take hold of it. You must engage and transform it. This one is for you. I came across this while reading through the life and prophetic ministry of Elisha, the son of Shaphat. He began as the protege of, of Elijah. God identified him as the one whom Elijah should take under his wing because he would be his successor. And as the time of transition approached, Elijah... Elijah tell, let, lets him know, I'm not going to be around here for very much longer. And Elisha, having requested a double portion of Elijah's anointing and having been told by Elijah that if he sees, my God, Elisha, when Elijah is taken up, if Elisha continues to the very end, he will receive the request. And Elisha, having, ser having heard that, continues serving Elijah, continues walking with him, continues learning, continues catching what, what Elijah is dropping down until the chariot of fire separates them and takes Elijah into heaven. And as a result, he inherits Elijah's cloak as a symbol of the prophetic mantle that is now conferred upon him. The prophetic agency of Elijah now rests upon Elisha. And the chapters that follow depict Elisha exercising the agency that he now possesses. Our text puts us in the middle of a story involving Elisha and a wealthy woman from Shunem, a village within the tribe of Issachar's allotment. 
This woman, along with her husband, were moved to extend hospitality and generosity towards uh, Elisha. Whenever he would be in town, they prepared a room upstairs in their home where, where he could stay. And, and there he would find food to eat and, and a bed upon which he could sleep. Eventually, Elisha is touched by their generosity and their hospitality, and he asks Gehazi, is there anything by, that, that they need that we can provide to show our appreciation? And Gehazi lets him, lets him know they don't have a son. And hearing that they are without child, Elisha pronounces that they would have a son within a year. The woman, upon hearing that, warns him against getting her hopes up. But Elisha insists. According to his word, the woman conceived and bore a son. And, and the, the chapter continues years later. The child complains of a headache, sits on his mother's lap, and there he dies. The woman instructs her servants to take the son up to the room where Elisha stayed and lay him in the bed on which Elisha slept. She then sent message to her husband to saddle up a donkey so that she could go where Elisha is and bring him back. Her husband warns her that there are certain times of the year where, where the prophet receives people. And it's, and it's none of those times. It's not the new moon. It's, it's not any of the festivals. It's not even the Sabbath. In other words, uh, the husband says, the time is not right to go to the prophet with this concern. And the woman says, I don't care about those things. I, the time that my son has died is the time that I need to go, go see him. And so she journeys. She journeys towards Mount Carmel. And the Bible says that Elisha sees her from a distance. He instructs his servant Gehazi to go down and see if everything is all right with her, her husband, and her child. To which the woman responds to Gehazi, everything is well. But when she gets to Elisha, when she gets to where Elisha is, she, she grabs his feet, cries out in anguish, did I ask you for a son? And didn't I say, don't deceive me and get my hopes up? In other words, the woman is saying, what kind of game are you and God playing that you would give me a son only to have that boy taken away from me? What kind of God provokes hope and then permits that very hope to be dashed? What kind of God prompts you to take one step only to be pushed back to? I ain't asked for it. And if you weren't going to sustain it, why give it to me? Anyway, sensing her pain, Elisha gives Gehazi his staff, tells him to take it, lay it on the boy's face. But the mother said, uh-uh, 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 uh-uh. As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I won't go home unless you go with me. The woman says, I ain't come here for Gehazi. I came for you. And I'm not leaving unless you go with this in the matter of delegation. You can't pass this one off. This one belongs to you. You got to handle this one. The next words read, so Elisha returned with her. Elisha heard the call for his personal agency. And there are several things about this that are worth lifting for, for all of us. And, and the first thing is prophetic agency arises from knowing that with awareness comes an assignment that can't be delegated. It, it, it starts out with, with the understanding that with awareness there is an assignment that can't be delegated. This, this woman, she comes to Elisha with one thing in mind. Bring him back home for her boy. She passes by Gehazi. She gets to Elisha. Because this was for Elisha's ears. And she shares the information 
with that in mind. And with Elisha seeking to deputize Gehazi, the woman says, this one is not for Gehazi. This one is for you. And the Bible says, so Elisha returned with her. Now, I must let you know that Elisha's response is not based upon the woman. It's based upon what he hears from God through the woman. It's not the woman's call. It's God's call through the woman. Friends, the call to prophetic agency is, is the call from God. And it arises out of the discernment that with your personal awareness, God is issuing a personal assignment. In other words, what God brings to you demands something from you. And because you see it, because you sense it, because you feel it, because you know it, because you understand it, you are personally called to it. This isn't about what someone else saw, heard, felt, understood, or knew. No, if it was for others, they would have seen it. They would have heard it. They would have felt it. They would have understood it. They would have known it. But since you heard it, since you've seen it, since you felt it, since you've understood it, since you've known it, it's for you to do something in response. It calls for the exercise of your agency. It calls for the lifting of your voice. It calls for the giving of your time, your talent, your treasure. Because, friends, your awareness means your assignment. Elisha couldn't shift responsibility and accountability. This was his to own. After all, he was the one who inquired about the woman and her husband, did they have any need? He was the one who uttered the promise from God that they would have a child. He was the one to whom the woman said, don't get my hopes up, don't play with my feelings. It was all Elijah. Gehazi wasn't in the Kool-Aid, didn't know the flavor. This was all Elisha. And as God's vehicle in promise, so does she look for Elisha in challenge. One of the issues raised in this text is, what is the extent of Elisha's agency? Is it limited to promise pronouncement? Is his agency just a matter of making distant statements? Does his agency extend into the midst of mystery, tragedy, pain, and even death. It, it is, is, Elijah's, is Elisha's agency just for the good and not for the bad? By Elisha's decision to return with her, Elisha demonstrates that his agency is not limited to promising the good, but it also extends to presence in the worst. His returning with her is the commitment to be present in the worst, with the worst, and for the worst. Friends, the call to prophetic agency, this, this call that God is making on every one of us is the call to be present in the worst. It responds to the call to show up in the troubling, the traumatic, and the tragic. It is to be found in the bothersome and in the burdensome. As those who are called to represent, to make God present in the earth, we are given agency to reflect God's presence when things are at their worst. We are called to shine when things are at their darkest time. We are called to be salt when life is the least flavorful. Elisha returns. He returns with the woman and he receives the message. Gehazi says, the child is indeed dead. I, I took your staff. I, I, I put it over, over his face. Nothing happened. He's dead. And so Elisha now goes into the room where he had slept on many a night. He enters the room where 
years ago, he uttered the promise that this woman and her husband would have a son. And now, here he is in that room with a dead boy lying on his bed. From the place where he proclaimed life, he is now confronted with death. From the place from which he inspired hope, he is now met with despair. He is present in the worst. He enters the room. He shuts the door behind him and begins to pray to God. Notice now, neither the woman, the father, nor Gehazi would see how Elisha would exercise his agency. This would be hidden to them. We get to see it by way of the narrative, but they don't get to see it by way of life. What that lets you know is not every exercise of agency is for public viewing. Not everybody gets to see what you do that will benefit them. They may see the results, but they won't see the process. They won't see the struggle. They won't see the sacrifice. They won't see the ups and downs, the ins and outs, the, the pushes and the pulls. Some acts of agency are private. It's just you. It's what you face. And God, everything is not for Facebook. Everything is not for Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, or LinkedIn. Some things are just for you and God. The world may see the results, but the process, the work, and the wrestling is for you and God. Do you see Elisha? Do you see him now in the room? The Bible says that Elisha prays. He solicits help and the power of God. He acknowledges God to be the source of his agency and for God to be the securer of the outcome that he desires because God wants us to know whatever agency you possess has God as its source and whatever outcome you seek has God as its securer. Only God can give life. Only God can perform the miraculous. Only God can and soften hearts. Only God can change minds. Only God can transform lives. Elijah says, God, I know you're saying I got to handle this, but I want you to know I really know this one is for you. And sometimes, sometimes, sometimes God needs you to get into a closet and say, I realize that there's agency and ownership for me to exercise, but, but God, I want you to know I understand that this really is for you to handle. That's what our forebears understood when they would sing those words, Father, I stretch my hands to thee, no other help I know. If thou withdraw thyself from me, oh, where, oh, where, oh, where, oh, where shall I go? That's what Elisha was doing. And so he prays to God, and then the Bible says he stretches himself out over the body of the Lord, uh, of, uh, of the boy. Now notice. Elisha goes from instructing Gehazi to extend his staff over the boy to now stretching himself out over the boy. He recognizes that this requires more than staff extension. He realizes it requires personal stretching. The call to prophetic agency is the call to stretch yourself. The exercise of agency that will be transformative and restorative in our day is one that challenges each one of us to stretch. It calls for an exertion of more than your normal capacity. It summons you to expand your reach to cover what is necessary. It, it calls for you to exert a degree of, of, of energy and effort beyond your normal positioning. To, to stretch is to go beyond where you normally are. This is a season that is demanding that we stretch calls for a stretch in thought, a stretch in perception, a stretch in understanding, a stretch in imagination, a stretch in creativity and innovation, a stretch in patience, a stretch in belief, a stretch 
in endurance, a stretch in our generosity. It calls for us to stretch. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing, expecting different results. This is a season that says your normal posture will not be enough. It will not be sufficient. You've got to be willing to stretch yourself. Do you see? Do you see Elisha? Do you see him as he stretches himself out over the boy such that his mouth is on the child's mouth, his eyes are on the child's eyes, and his hands are on the child's hands? This is an intimate stretching. It's not distant, it's up close, it's personal, it's eye upon eye, mouth upon mouth, hand upon hand. As Elisha stretches himself out over the boy, he comes into contact with eyes whose light have been extinguished. He comes in contact with a mouth that is not breathing. He comes in contact with hands that have grown cold and lifeless. God is calling for a personal agency that stretches into actual contact with the condition of other people. It's where the life that you have makes contact with what does not have life. It's where your agency makes contact with the impotency of others. It's where your sufficiency makes contact with the lack of that others are experiencing. It's where your strength makes contact with the weakness that others have, where your hope makes contact with the despair that is troubling others, where your life literally confronts the death that is going on in society. God is calling for a stretch that makes personal contact with spirits that have withered, with hearts that have grown cold, and with eyes whose light has grown, dim, has grown dim. He's calling for us to stretch. He's calling for us to stretch and make, and make personal contact. And notice now, as Elisha does so, the boy's body becomes warm. At that moment, Elisha gets up, walks to and fro across the room, and then returns to stretch out again. He is persistent in the exercise of his agency. He is not discouraged by the boy not returning to life after he stretched one time because he recognizes that an escalation in body temperature is a sign for him to keep on stretching. Friends, in the exercise of agency, you and I, we must resist being discouraged when life doesn't result just because we stretched. When breathing does not occur just because we stretched. When a sneeze does not happen, a cough does not happen just because we stretched. What the Bible is telling us right here is if there's a change in the temperature, progress is being made. There may not be a breath, but there may be a warming. There may be a turning. There may be an opening. It, it may not be a 20-degree increase. It may just be a 5-degree increase. But the 5 degrees invites you to stretch again. You may not see a 90-degree change overnight. But, but if you shift a ship by 1 degree, you alter where that ship ends up. And I've learned that if I can get 91-degree ships... I achieved the 90 degree change that I've been looking for. And I don't know for whom this one is aimed, but God is encouraging you to stretch again. He's encouraging you to extend yourself again, to exert yourself again. May not be any breath happening, but the body is getting warm. And it may be one degree or, or 10 degrees, whatever it is, God is saying, stretch out again. And so that's what, that's what Elisha does. He, he returns, and the Bible says he stretches himself out over the boy another time. And that time, the Bible says that the boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Ah, with the last thing that the boy did prior to death was exhaling. 
The first thing for the boy in being restored is his respiration. And his increased respiration, not just sneezing one time, but he had to sneeze seven times for the fullness of breath and respiration to occur is signified, my God. And when that hope, when that happens, when he sneezes for the seventh time, when full respiratory function has returned to him, the Bible says he opens his eyes. Now, friends, when you consider this within the context of Elisha is now, he, he is in the early part of his exercising his prophetic agency. You come to better understand why Elisha had to do this, why, why this couldn't be done by Gehazi going and just waving a staff over the boy's face. But Elisha had to go with the woman. He had to stretch himself. He had to exercise his personal agency because there was something that God wanted Elisha to see. Having taken up the mantle from Elijah, whom God used in 1 Kings 17 to raise a widow's son from death, Elisha needed to know that God's power would not be less with him. That the same power that God demonstrated with Elijah would be the power that God would demonstrate with Elisha. That's why, that's why Elisha had to go himself. That's why he had to stretch himself out because God wanted him to know that the anointing that was resting upon his life was no less powerful than what was on Elijah's life. I'm trying to help somebody here. The God who is God is not one whose reach and reign are limited to any one person or any one generation. Generation. God is God in all generations. He's help in all generations. He's strength in all generations. He's healing in all generations. Lord, thou has been our dwelling place in all generations from everlasting to everlasting. Thou art God. And so here it is. As you exercise your agency, there are things that God desires for you to see yourself. Self. That's why it can't be pushed out on somebody else because God says, no, there's something you're going to see about who I am by you exercising the agency that I have given you. God wants you to see his faithfulness from generation to generation just as he was faithful to my grandparents who were born in the time of a pandemic, who lived through World War I, the Great Depression and World War II, just as he he was faithful to my parents who grew up towards the end of the depression, World War II, the civil rights movement, and the Vietnam War, the assassinations of Medgar and Malcolm and Martin and JFK and Robert Kennedy. And just as God has been faithful to me and my generation, having grown up at the end of Vietnam, Watergate, the hostage crisis in Iran, the Challenger disaster, Black Monday of 1987, the Iraq war and 9-11 so is God faithful to my children's generation having experienced the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq the 2008 recession and now COVID-19 and as God has equipped every generation for agency before so is God equipping this generation right now to exercise an agency that will address the needs and concerns of this present age uh, because God is the same God from generation to generation and therefore Elisha's call to exercise agency was not just for Elisha to see but also for Elisha to be seen with the boy now alive Elisha says we can open the door and folk can come in and see the results of the agency that's been exercised he calls for the mother and when the mother comes in he tells her to take
take her son. She falls at his feet, uh, overwhelmed with gratitude. Because watch this, God's power continued, God's glory continued, God's purpose continued, and God's plan continued. And God wants to show who he is in the agency that you exercise. He wants to show when you show up in agency in whatever role you fulfill, God wants to be seen to be the same God with the same power because what he wants to show is that your agency is secured by the power and relevance of God for every generation. Answering God's call to agency is done in the knowledge, my God, that God is as powerful today as he was in generations before. He's the same God with the same power and as he empowered the generations before to endure, to sacrifice and to transform so will God empower we who live today. He'll empower us to endure. He'll empower us to sacrifice. He'll empower us to transform as God used their stretching. Lord have mercy to be able to bring life so will God use our stretching to bring life because he's the same God. He's got the same power. And that, my friends, is our assurance. And we don't have it just because God was the same God with the same power in terms of Elijah and Elisha. No, no, no. It's not just the fact that God was the same God with the same power with our forebears. But, friends, there is a greater example, a far more fundamental and fuller demonstration. And it was in God's very own Son, in the Lord Jesus Christ who answered the call who came into the world for the sins of us all and he came I mean it was a stretch for divinity to take on humanity it was a stretch my God for infinity to take on the finite it was a stretch for the immortal to take on mortality it was a stretch for the incorruptible to take on a corruptible body it was a stretch for the Lord of glory to become a servant but he stretched himself uh, God God came through a virgin woman born in a stable in Bethlehem and he stretched himself and made connection with those who had need. He stretched his hand to touch a leper and gave him healing. He stretched my God his life and gave deliverance for those who were captive. He stretched and brought my God life to three people who had already died and then he said I'm going to show you what real stretching is because on that Friday on the hill called Calvary, when they hung him high, and yes, they stretched him wide. He stretched himself. My God, he was so intimate. He took on my sins and, and your sins. He took on our rebellion. He took on our depravity. He took it all on. He faced the wrath of God by himself. He died on our behalf. He faced hell on our behalf. And then on the third day morning, God raised him up with all power in his hand. And I don't know about you, but I'm so glad he stretched himself on my behalf. I'm so glad that he exercised his agency on my behalf because I'm saved by his power. I'm raised by his power. I'm changed by his power. I'm transformed by his power. I'm called by his power. I'm commissioned by his power. I'm sent by his power. I'm assured by his power. I preach in his power. I witness in his power. I serve in his power. I stretch by his power. I, I don't mind exercising agency because the power does not belong to me. The power belongs to God. The very same power that raised Jesus from the dead. That power is made available to you and to me. The same power that calms raging seas. That same power that can make mountains speak. That same power is available to you and to me. And so child of God, I'm calling forth for you to rise up in your agency. I'm calling for you man and woman of God to rise up in your agency. I'm calling you fathers and mothers to rise up in your agency. I'm calling you teachers and mentors to rise up in your agency. I'm calling you citizens to rise up in your agency. I'm calling you saints of God. God, the light of the world and the salt of the earth to rise up in your agency. Yeah. Knowing that the same God
that gave others agency. He's the same God that will give you agency. And the same power and boldness that they possessed is the same power and boldness that you will possess. And all that he desires is that you be open, that you be responsive to the call that he is making on your life. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, you've issued a call of ownership. You've issued a call of agency. We thank you, God, that you've given us personal agency. Just in who we are. We have practical. We have positional. We have political. We have economic. And God, for some, this may, this may be quite revelatory because some may not have felt very powerful lately. So much has been out of our control. So much has been out of our hands. It's hard to feel that you have agency when you can't go to work. When you can't do some of the things that, that you would do every day. But yet, oh God, you remind us that even in such circumstances, we do have agency. We have power. We have influence. We have imagination that can cause us to see opportunities in the midst of a shutdown. We can pivot and do virtual vacation Bible school when we can't gather in rooms. We can have a tech fit camp virtually when we can't be in the facility where all of the, all of the tools normally would be. Oh God, we do have agency. We have a voice. We have lives that, that touch people every day. We have agency. And so, Father, right now, I'm, I'm, I'm praying for that, that you literally will stretch yourself out upon that person who's been despairing, who's been depressed. God, will you awaken them to their agency, to their power, to their worth, to their value, to their ability to to get through this, their ability to overcome it, their ability to, to transform it, their ability to make it better. Oh God, will you awaken, will you awaken your people to the agency that we have? Oh God, will you awaken us to the fact that, that sometimes we may not know methodology, but we have agency. And oh God, that we can trust you if we just follow as you direct, you'll make the method plain. you make the process clear. Sometimes, oh God, it will be us shutting a door with just us and you and nobody else around. It will be as simple as stretching ourselves out. Feeling the body get warm. Pace back and forth and stretch out again. And God, I hear somebody, I hear somebody saying, how many times I got to stretch? You tell them, stretch until what you know happens. Stretch until something sneezes. Stretch until some eyes open. Stretch until you can open the door and tell the world, come in and see what the Lord should. We thank you, God, that there's redemption in the stretch because the Savior who's stretched himself for us now stretches himself through us. We bless your name. The name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hallelujah.